Welcome to the Witness and Perse- Persecution Podcast with Nick and Ruth Ripkin, where we equip you with biblical principles and practices from believers in persecution to help you cross the street and cross the oceans with the good news of Jesus. I'm your host, Anthony Ball. Today we have a Nick Ripkin. And Nick, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. We've been in uh, with you in Dallas, Texas all weekend, and so uh, it, after two back surgeries in the last two years, it takes me about a week to catch up from a weekend, and so, so anyway, we're doing all right. Got our grandson with us. Had a good day. That's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, I mean, anytime that you spend four days with me, and it's only you've only had a three-day break since you've seen me, so... You might need to take another week or so to, to recover of, from that. And two of those days were in the airport. <laughs> airport and the airplane. Your, your plane yeah. misadventures. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Well, I'm glad you're back home, and we really enjoyed uh, getting to be with you in DFW. And we've we got lots of great feedback from the weekend and from our uh, movie event with the students. And so that's kind of a shameless plug. We're going to try to do more movie events around the country for churches and people that want to set that up. And so uh, for our listeners today, uh, it was very, very powerful to have 150 plus college students in a room watching the insanity of God. And then, of course, the extra blessing of getting to hear from you and having that Q&A with you and Ruth was just phenomenal. So uh, it often, we, we're still... It, op- it often happens with students... You know, they stayed so long asking questions and things that the staff turned off the lights and they still didn't leave. <laughs> you know, I actually was very impressed because I think it was like 9.45 p.m. I looked down at my phone and I looked up and you guys are still sharing and still answering. And um, I think maybe two students had left at that point. I thought that was really amazing. So we, we've got a lot of great feedback. Students are really challenged and really, really thinking and praying through what does God want me to do with both with that information and now with my, my life, you know? Well, so I, I just wish we had so much more time because what believers in persecution do, they set the bar so biblically higher uh, mm, yeah. that, that, the bar is so low in American Christianity that just sharing your faith with one person would be, you know, like you, you've hit on a moonshot, but what we're trying yeah. to do is, is, is to get back to a, a biblical way of life. And, and it's not lifting up believers in persecution. It's highlighting how believers in persecution lift up Jesus in, in good times and bad times uh, in freedom, in jail. So, um, we, we just need to, uh, go back to not past tense, but present active tense Christianity. Absolutely. Uh, that's a really good word. You know, um, for our, our show today, I mean, that's a great transition because for our show today, we're going to address some of the complexities of persecution and not just persecution, but the response to persecution and you talking about uh the the bar of biblical christianity versus uh, and don't want to get in trouble today but the, the the low bar of american christianity we're going to be addressing that today because you're going to talk to us a little bit about what does the response to persecution look like in different places i know you're going to highlight the soviet union in those many decades but tell us a little bit about how 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 did we find persecution? What what did that look like in the Soviet Union in particular? And then can you give us a little insight into why some churches and believers responded with with fear and just kind of submitting to whatever the, the government told them to do or not to do, and why some lived out very bold and victorious faith? What are the, the common denominators of that in their response to persecution? Well, the the thing that you had in the Soviet Union is what Ruth and I came, I think we coined the phrase top-down persecution because your persecutor was outside of your home. Uh, matter of fact, when we would get to China, uh, your family could be pagans, they could be Buddhist, atheists, uh, and yet if they arrested you, they would hide you, uh, pass you from home to home, 
and and against the wishes of house church leaders, uh, they would pay a bribe to get you out of jail, which just turns arresting Christians into a cottage industry. But in the Soviet mm-hmm. Union, they were much more canny, much wiser in persecution uh, than they were in Ch- in China. In the Soviet Union, they swallowed the church over 70 years, inch by inch by inch, to when freedom came, political freedom came, the late 1800s to the early 19, not, you know, in 89 and, and 1991, the church had been swallowed so much that it was up to their chin and, 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 and they had compromised in many cases so much, uh, that those who were left, uh, later on, had to face the music and because what they did, I mean, you got your Stalin and, and you got your Lenin and, and they killed, you know, millions of people. And when you get someone like that, uh, it, it, it's like uh, uh, what we have in, in what we had in Somalia, what you've got in war zones today. You just pray God limit the time and that a remnant remains. Mm. Uh, that was China in 48 and 49. But the Soviet Union just swallowed you bit by bit by bit. I mean, the first 50 pastors, deacons, elders in the Soviet Union that we sit with, I learned early on after listening to their stories for three and four and five hours. Uh, and in some of the places in Soviet Union, I sat with men and families for two and three days because they not only knew their faith in the context of their culture. They knew their faith in the context of their country, and they knew their faith in the context of what was going on in the world. And so they had so much Mm. to teach us. But if you're in the rural place or whatever, then you're you're more than likely not going to have that worldview. But when I asked them, what was uh, the Bible story? or, Or at that time, I wasn't using Bible stories because I'd been so westernized. But I would ask them what, whether there was a, a verse that they would claim the most. And and 35 out of the first 50 that I interviewed uh, reported that their verse, life's verse, was Revelation uh, 2.10, to be faithful unto death. And they actually were. Wow. And, and so... What by the time you get to Khrushchev, though, they're getting exceptionally canny because every pastor in Russia, in the Ukraine, less so in the satellite nations, but more so in some, less so in others, depending upon the government of the day. If you were a pastor, Mm -hmm. a leader, you had a Soviet handler, you had to go to his office every Monday morning. And early on in the Soviet Union, he would ask you questions like, um, uh, who, who was the guest speaker that you had Sunday? Who was the person that gave you an interview, who, who, who gave a testimony? Or who was the person that came in and sang special music? They knew Anthony. Mm-hmm. They knew everything that happened in that church. They always had people wow. inside that church. They're just trying to get you to talk. They're trying to get you comfortable in and telling them and giving them information. And, and, mm-hmm. and, and so, but each time they're going a little bit deeper and deeper. Uh, and, and so on, on Monday mornings you would come and, and, and they'd get you to talk for an hour or so. And some early on knew, uh, uh, to give unto Jesus. What is Jesus and mm-hmm. give under Caesar? What is Caesar's? And, and, and when Jesus spoke those words, that was raw heresy. Because everything belonged to Caesar, according to Caesar. But Jesus was saying, your witness, uh, your worship, uh, your Bible study, uh, Caesar doesn't get those. Uh, You keep those to yourself. And yet uh, they would make you sit at a chair or stand in front of a desk and, 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 and see what they would get you to say and how much they could get you. And then, uh, uh, the day would come that you would walk in and they would have a Bible sitting on their desk and they would ask you, uh, do you recognize this book? And they said, yes. Well, what is it? It's the Bible. And they would make you open it up to those verses 
in Romans chapter 13 and read it to where God has ordained governments and that we are to be obedient to the government. And the Soviet Union, the atheist leaders would look at the pastor and the denominational leaders and say, your holy book tells you to be obedient to me and that I have been ordained and you have to serve my cause and therefore I'm telling you to do this and this and this and you have to do it. Hmm. And brother, all of the churches and the pastors and the leaders that compromised themselves in the 70 years of the Soviet Union, they lived in Romans 13. They justified hmm. their actions in Romans 13. And, and today I hear in the Bible Belt churches about how uh, they can have uh, certain persons uh, in government that have very lax morals and, uh, uh, you know, whether they're on the right or whether they're on the left, and, and they, they will excuse those morals because that government person has been ordained by God. And again, not saying what Jesus said when they asked him whether they should uh, uh, pay the imperial tax. And he asked whose image is on it. And they said, Caesar. And he just said, you give to Caesar's what is Caesar's, but you give to God what is God. And that's a, a, not just a hint. That's a clear declaration. that There's a lot of things that don't belong to God. Your wit- witness, your, your worship. Uh, don't belong uh, to Caesar, you mean? Yes, they don't belong yeah. to Caesar whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And and so they would bring that pastor in and, and they would make him quote or read Romans 13. And then they would, if that guy didn't get a, a, a serious about being obedient and doing what the Soviet Union leadership was saying, he said, and by the way, pastor, you know, your your wife sometimes takes a shortcut home from the market. And, and, you know, we're, we've been trying to catch those guys who've been throwing acid in the face of women whose husbands uh, are not getting with the program, which is a, a barefaced lie. They can catch anybody they want to catch at any time. And the yeah. only way you can throw acid or cut somebody's face with razors is because you're being allowed to, uh, uh, you know, the Soviet Union can keep denial at the United Nations or mm. something like that. Uh, but at the same time, they, they have people that are carrying out their dirty work. And they say, you know, Pastor, it really would be bad if your wife shows up at home having somehow had acid thrown in her face or somebody cut her with a razor. And, and you know, Pastor, uh, unlike uh, most people, your kids are getting a good education. Wouldn't it be horrible if they lost their place at school and and you have this nice home and everything. And would it be horrible if you lost your home? And so what they threaten you with is your blessings, the blessings mm. of your kids getting education, the blessings of your wife keeping her looks, uh, uh, the blessing of having a church building, of having a job. And, and so uh, that's what the Soviet Union was so good at, was holding hostage uh, uh, to your blessings and, 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 and threatening that. And they'd get that young man and and what they're doing, they're swallowing you inch by inch by inch by inch and and, and making you meet with him every Monday morning and then threatening those that you love. And then it comes that day where Mm -hmm. Khrushchev said to all of the pastors across the Soviet Union, he just sent the word abroad uh, uh, that uh, you play basketball on a basketball court and you play soccer on a soccer field uh, and and you do church in a church building. And so Mm. they said to the pastors, now you're done. You're done. If you will go into your church buildings, I don't care if you meet seven days a week. I don't care if you live there. You can Mm. do whatever you want to do inside of those church buildings but you will not any longer worship in your homes. And if I catch you witnessing in the marketplace, and by the way, this is what Putin has done again. 
in the Soviet Union the last few years, he has uh, uh, systematically kicked out foreign workers, missionaries, and he mm-hmm. has limited them uh, to, to, to worshiping in their churches. And he's taken the house and the marketplace away from places where you can serve mm. Almighty God. And he is saying what you render under Caesar is a much broader 95% of your world and 5% is what you do on a Sunday morning inside your church. And so if you want wow. to keep your job, if you want to keep your kids in school, uh, you, you, you do whatever you want to with your Jesus inside the church. And just like they did in the, in the New Testament inside the synagogue and the, and the, and the temple. But if you step outside of the church building and you, you, you take this mm-hmm. to the marketplace and into your families. And, and by the way, you always know what you should do by what the persecutor tries to stop you from doing. And if the persecutor tries to make you go to the right, Even if you don't know why to do that, you go to the left. If they try to make you go up, you go down. You can learn by what you should be doing, by what the persecutor tries to take away from you. You can, you can learn. Yeah. You can learn what's important to the kingdom of God by what they try to take away from you. And so they're trying uh, to use the Bible against you and, and use you to, be obedient to them and tell you to go into your churches and to sit down and to worship there. And, and, and that, and, and, and so there are, are churches virtually on the same street that stood up in front of their church members and said, uh, here's what the government, whom the Bible tells us to be obedient to here's the law of the Medes and the Persians. And, 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 and we're going to have to stop the Bible studies that we have going on in the homes and, 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 and what they don't know is that if they're continuing witnessing outside the church and they're continue witnessing and worshiping in their homes, that their pastors are telling on them when they go to visit their communist handler every Monday morning, usually. And, and, and when the Soviet Union fell, they had taken such copious notes that the church and the denominational entities all across the Soviet Union got the notes. And in some of the countries, 90% of the denominational workers and the pastors lost their positions because the church members got to read the way that they had informed upon them to the wow. communist leadership. Hmm. My goodness. Unbelievable. My goodness. Just to keep their position, just to keep hmm. their salaries, just to keep their children in church, because the more that the church is defined by property, buildings, professions, uh, processions, and denominations, the easier it is for Satan through the persecutors to control us. We Mm. need to hear the words of the Lord here. 95% of every dollar is kept within church uh, buildings in the West, particularly in the South. And 5% is sent uh, to the nations and only 2% of evangelical churches send out missionaries to the nations when Jesus commanded with his last words on earth, uh, uh, he wow. commanded uh, missions is not a call. It's a command to go yeah. into all the nations. And, and that's what hurt pastors and leaders in the Soviet Union is hurting leaders in China today that when they are arrested and put in jail, when they are arrested and put in labor camps and put in prisons, they lose their ability to get a passport. And those who hunger to go to the nations Mm. can't because they won't let them out of the country. They won't let them leave. They they won't give them the the papers to, uh, uh, to get out. And and so uh, 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 there came the day where they told them uh, you can do uh, a church in a church building. Uh, You can't do it 
except uh, there, if you try to do it in homes or the marketplace, we're going to get you. And here's what they would do. The pastor stood up and he actually told what the persecutors were doing to him. And in the Soviet Union, uh, Anthony, they were so smart. At every level of the church, they had uh, uh, four backups. They had four uh, disciples, whether they were a preaching pastor, whether they were a, a, a denominational leader, a deacon, an elder, even the person who kept the financial books. He would have four Timothys or Timotheas, if you will, uh, backing him up. So when the Soviet Union came inside the church building on a Sunday morning and took the pastor out of the pulpit, his Timothy would stand up the next Sunday. And after he did that for months, they would come and get him out of the pulpit. But it would have to do that four times in succession in order to empty that pulpit out of trained leadership. And then you know what they would do? They would bring their proxy to the church. They will bring their pet preacher from somewhere else and bring him and put him in the pulpit. And in, in situation after situation, I learned to talk, especially to the elderly women. And you want to know what's cool? That when they had worship on Sunday in those churches that stayed faithful to God, Those elderly women, because the men were in prison, the men were in labor camps, the men were not allowed to be in church. They they were moved to jobs outside of their community. And so the churches came filled with uh, uh, young children, uh, pre-teenagers, mothers, uh, nursing mothers, and especially those old babuska, uh, those grandmothers. They would come into church Hmm. and they would sing. They would give, they would dance, uh, they would give their offerings, uh, uh, they would worship the Lord. And then when the communist placed pastor got up to preach his approved sermon by the governments of the Soviet Union, those older women, what they do, first of all, they would line the pulpit area and lock arms and not let him in the pulpit. (laughs) <laughs> they would keep him and they didn't, you know, and they were wise because those old women were so honored and, and so respected that no one would, would, would beat them. No one would push aside. And so that, that pet pastor would not know what to do. And so he would turn around and leave. And so week after week and for some time months, uh, they continued going the house of God, but they would lock arms and, 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 block the pulpit area and not let that pet pastor up up there to preach his nonsense. But then Mm. there came the time where they would abuse those older ladies uh, and knock them down and do bad things to them. And then the pet pastor Mm. would get up and preach. And you know what all those old ladies would do? They would stand up when he started preaching with their backs toward the pulpit. Wow. (laughs) Yes. Wow. Wow. They, They would not let, they would they would show him what they thought about him and, and how they knew what he was up to and who he had been sent from. And they would block uh, the, the pulpits and, and not let him in. And Khrushchev then passed a law. And the law was anybody under 16 years of age, I see, anybody 16 years of age, I'm going to get, I've got to get this right. Anybody under 21 years of age was no longer allowed in the church. Hmm. If you were 21 years of age, and and, and, and the truth is going to be the same if I don't get the age right, but if you were 21 years of age or younger, you are no longer allowed uh, 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 to be uh, inside of the church. And Hmm. pastor after pastor after pastor again refused they refuse wow. uh, to do that. And yet pastor after pastor after pastor stood in the pulpits of the churches of the Soviet Union, mm-hmm. often with tears running down their faces and stood and quoted those verses from Romans 13 again 
and again and again and said, the law has been passed that if you're 21 years of age, you can no longer attend church. And he kicked his own church members out of the building, even his own children. Wow. Even his own children. And three of these deacons were in a prison camp. Did I, did I talk about that in, in, in Siberia already? Uh, not yet. Well, they, they were in a prison camp in Siberia. Uh, uh, four deacons that I were allowed to, to interview when I got to the Soviet Union mm-hmm. uh, in Russia, in, in, in the Ukraine. And while they were there, 400 pastors were put into that labor camp and, and because they refused to kick out uh, 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 their own church members. And yeah. the rumor went around the labor camp that these pastors were not to live past six months. And so mm. they didn't do anything to those pastors. They never beat them. They never mistreated them. All they would do is uh, send them out to the frozen tundra in the winter time when it was 30 some below zero, 30 degrees below zero. Yeah. And, and, and with broken sticks and and iron bars and a broken pick or shovel. And they were told they'd had to dig up the ground to prepare it for the pr- spring. And if you had a bulldozer and a backhoe, it couldn't chip that ground. Oh yeah, It's frozen that hard. And when they couldn't accomplish their task, they would come back inside the labor camp that had no way to heat it, no way to cool it. And all they did was make the pastors strip down to their underwear. And then they threw a bucket of cold water on them. Hmm. they never touched them and all of them were dead in three months 100% of them were dead wow. they had typhoid cholera of course they got the flu they got pneumonia and 400 pastors were dead hmm. in four months and thrown out in their frozen ground for the uh, the wolves and the and the beasts to devour them and I uh, wow. and I sat for days with those four Deacons and this one deacon, while he, uh, uh, his his son, was the president of one of the seminaries in the re- Ukraine, and the situation there has changed now. And uh, his son was the inter- was a translator for his dad, and he came out of that uh, 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 three years in that Siberian prison. And he and his wife, they had killed his wife or allowed her to die, wouldn't let her have medical treatment. And she came, he came back out of prison and, and he, and he found that his wife had died and they didn't tell him that he died. She died early on while he was in prison. And he went and got his teenage son from his brother that had taken, taken care of him once his son, his, his wife had died. And he went back to his home church after watching those 400 pastors die because they would not compromise uh, in who attended the church. And he went back to his home church mm. and his, and the pastor said, I'm sorry, uh, your son can't come here to his home church that he was serving wow. when he was arrested and sent to Siberia. And he took his son by the hand and he left that church and he never went back. Those wow. churches are all that dead. suffering. Those churches, those churches don't exist today. And yet those churches in which the pastors went to prison and the deacons went to prison and the pastors were tortured and they lost their lives, those churches are meeting today. And those churches, those are the stories that the church are telling today. The problem is that at the fall of the Soviet Union, 45% of the pastors immigrated from Russia and from other places and the status of the church before Putin took over was much weaker under political freedom and under democracy than it ever had been under persecution under the former Soviet Union. But now that Putin has taken over, uh, the church got so used to, uh, you know, free willing democracy. And so many of the pastors and leaders immigrated to the West and so many of the pastors, the reports they have now in their hands of how they compromised, that the church doesn't have the ingrained leadership that it had 
before Putin took over. And so these are some tough days for the church. And we need to pray for them as we've never prayed for them. Because under the uh, other communism, they had 70 years to develop uh, godly men and godly families and godly women right. and deacons and elders. And it's, uh, that generation is gone. They've either died or they immigrated. And a lot of those who immigrated, uh, their stories were not so pretty when the evidence was made known after the Soviet Union fall. But when they come to the Western world, of course, a different story is told. That doesn't mean that everyone that immigrated from Russia or the Ukraine or the Eastern satellite states uh, did so because they lost their witness where they're from, but many of them did. Mm. Found the same thing in in China and East Asia, that big churches, uh, there are huge Chinese churches on the West Coast, and and people would say, well, you need to interview this lady, and you don't have to go to China. This You can go to this great big church. But when I got to China, I found the reasons that they left uh, uh, the work that they had in, in East Asia was not so exemplary. It was... Um, mm very questionable indeed. And so the, 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 uh, the story I really took over uh, a year or so in the former Soviet Union was how it was consumed. Uh, communists consumed them just little by little by little by little and held them hostage to their own church uh, buildings and held them hostage to their mm. own denominational headquarters held them hostage uh, 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 to their own seminaries and, and, and again, to keep their property, to keep their buildings, to keep their uh, uh, possessions and their denominations and to keep their salaries, uh, uh, the, the bad guys were able to hold them hostage uh, to their blessings. And they didn't lay down what they should have laid down uh, when they were threatened by it so that the, they, they should, what we learned in other places, they walked away from what they were being held hostage to so that they serve the kingdom of God with faithfulness. Wow. You know, that, you really really that's why we're going, we've got some stories coming from those who refuse to lay yeah. them down. But uh, a lot of them, a lot of them compromised, my brother. And, and that was an overt mm -hmm. persecution. And the question for the West is, how much of this are we laying down when the persecution is covert? Because covert persecution is so much more effective mm. than overt persecution. And you only have the beatings, the jailings, the, the floggings, and the martyrdoms. The overt persecution only comes when the covert stuff doesn't work. Yeah, you... You've brought up just such a an insightful point because you know, as you're talking, I'm sitting here thinking, if I were the persecutor, it would make so much more sense if I'm if I'm Khrushchev or I'm I'm in leadership in the Soviet Union in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. If I'm you know by the world standards, it would make so much more sense to just say, just make everything illegal, shut everything down, kick everybody out. But maybe what you're saying is. That type of broad and immediate, you know, hammer to the church often would actually elicit in believers. No, we want to stand up for our faith. We want to stand up against what the government or whoever is in charge at that moment is doing. But it was so much more effective for them to devour piece by piece. Because I'm thinking it would just oh, make so much more sense if you're really yes. trying to destroy the church. Just just shut them down and kick them all out. Yeah, if if indeed ninety percent of us do not share our faith with another person among Protestant and evangelical churches in America, we didn't get there overnight. Mm. It was by piece wow. by piece by piece, but it was overt. And, and and what what they did in the Soviet Union was to tell the church members, uh, "You need to back off." Uh, you, you don't know enough. They, they would let the pastor keep the Bibles 
and keep the commentaries and take mm-hmm. them from normal church people and, and tie them to the pulpit and tie them to the sermons preached and tie them to the person that was ordained and trained and tell them you're not able to handle this properly and you don't want to have a second class denomination. So they chain the gospel to the pulpit and, and left uh, church people's bereaf of having their own devotions, their own house worship, mm. uh, of their own, their own d- discipline and joy of prayer and singing and reading their Bible. And, and over 70 years, uh, they start taking that uh, from them. But they had to do that mm. with a lot of beating, a lot of jelling, a lot of incarceration, a lot of people losing their lives. But the covert stuff in the West has worked to where the overt stuff hasn't been necessary. Wow. Explore that a little bit. In in the West, and I think probably for a lot of our listeners, particularly American culture, what what does that covert persecution look like here? Because I I think I know where you're going. I think I can think of some examples. But, you know, we don't necessarily have Although may maybe in some areas of the country, I'm not sure. We don't necessarily have a government saying you're allowed to do this or this or this small pieces. But what give us insight on the on the covert persecution you think exists in our in our world? You know what you'll get killed for in Saudi Arabia. Mm-mm. You don't know what I'm thinking, so you wouldn't know. I don't you, know. You, you know you can get you can get killed for a lot of things in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, but if you're caught practicing homosexuality they take you into a something like a soccer field with a with a with a with a stands filled of people and some the, the executioner takes your head off yeah if you're caught in some of these places like Saudi Arabia uh, 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 trying to abort uh, the fetus that God has planted in your womb they, or you've committed some kind of crime like that they take the woman to prison until her baby is is held to term and 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 then they uh take that baby and give it to a family member and then that woman who was seeking to abort that child or some other crime then she is killed after mm. she delivers the crap the, the, the child now christians must have and i choose my words very very carefully here a very christ like loving stance on social issues like homosexuality and abortion. But what people need to know uh, that are practicing those social sins or those social ills, they must know, Anthony, that you and I, our wives, our family, our church, we love them so much that we would give our lives for them. Hmm. And we don't stand at, we don't stand at a dis- distance and, and throw rocks. Now, in some of these practices, the church is doing some wonderful ministries to give you some alternatives uh, to, for instance, for throwing away your child. Uh, For the other one, some reason that scares us so much, we stand so far at a distance that they see the church as their enemy, not as someone that would give their lives for them. And and that Mm -hmm. doesn't mean we have to agree. That doesn't mean we lower our standards. But we're not known as much for our witness to the life and the death and the resurrection of our Christ as we are for our stance on social issues. And Mm. what I've just shared with that is the same that Islam has. So I want to have a different stance. Now, I'm going to have a different stance on those social issues. By the way, I love people. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and, and Jesus said, even to love your enemies. And these aren't my enemies unless I make them my enemies. Uh, but we are to be known again by sharing, uh, widespread in love, the death, the resurrection, uh, life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And we, and we don't do that in a drive by shooting, but we'll talk about that more later. But hmm. what the Soviet Union had to come and do overtly is it, it no longer worked uh, covertly. And, and, and mm. so they, it came 
to where their theme became uh, faithful unto death, not just faithful until it cost me my job, my pastorate, or faithful when it cost me uh, my freedom. And I didn't. And, and, but once I went to jail, they threatened me with prison, and I was no longer faithful. And faithful mm-hmm. as long as uh, I, I, my children. You know what they did to your children? You've got two young boys that we love desperately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but they would uh, often the pastor's children in all of e- Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, Ukraine would be the only Christian children in school. And they would make your children stand in the middle of the gym while the whole, uh, Mm. uh, 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 all the, everybody in that gym and the administration and the, and the kids ridiculed the pastor's kids and make you, and I I may have said this before, make you stay after school and uh, uh, Mm. make you go to the principal's office and ridicule you and you go home and you're seven, eight, nine years of age and, and you're crying broken. Why do you have to serve this stupid Jesus? Why can't we get out of this church? Why am, why am I the only one with parents like this? And, and yet they would get in their teen years, 12, 13, 14, and they would compare the loving lives of their mother, their father, and other Christian adults to those in the school, those in the marketplace, and their friends. And they would choose the Jesus of their families, of their fathers and mothers over uh, the nothing Mm -hmm. of the principals and their teachers because they saw the quality of Mm -hmm. their lives. And and that's what our children must see, us worshiping in our homes, our sharing of our faith, of having our neighbors in our homes and, 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 and loving them and sharing God's story, especially those that we disagree with socially. Uh, but yeah. in the Soviet Union, they swallowed the church inch by inch by inch by inch. It was different in China. Mm-hmm. It's far different in the Soviet in, in, in Islam, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. But they were so crafty, crafty for seventy years under the Soviet Union that uh, 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 the, 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 they were very effective in their persecution. And they even turned many denominational leaders into informers uh, uh, wow. of the church itself. Wow. I want to, before we uh, wrap up um, today, I do want to ask you about a connection because, you know, we don't want to get ourselves in trouble. And you have said many, many times you're not, opposed to, to, to brick and mortar buildings. You know, you're not opposed to denominations. You're not opposed uh, to these things, but you have made a very, very good point. The more that we are tied to those things, the easier it is for the persecutors to have a grip on us and ultimately uh, start tearing apart the church. So my question is, we can say this with all honesty. We look at our, our situation in the West and without judgment, without condemnation, we can see we are very much tied to our, our brick and mortar buildings. We're very much tied to our denominational structures, whatever that may be. What are lessons that we need to start operating on now? Because we can look at the parallels and see what the Soviet Union did in, in those 70 years. Um, one of the things that they were able to exploit was the attachment to these blessings. We absolutely have those here in the West. What do we need to start implementing today to avoid maybe the same fate in five years, 70 years, 100 years down the road? You know, I drive my wife crazy, and I'm a country boy. <laughs> and But I didn't know this until years, years after I was mentored by others who had the same proclivity, that I just see the – I see – I connect the dots. That's why – we can go to 700 almost believers in persecution and I can see uh, the way everything is connected and, and, and I can see uh, what we're doing right and what we're not doing so well. And so I, I bring that back to America as we come to teach here for the last 15 years and, 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 and we train missionaries that are going out. We teach in seminaries and, and one of the things that I've connected the dots on, Anthony, is no matter where we are, 
when we are in a church that's defined by bricks and mortars, as you say, uh, whether we're in Mexico City, whether we're in Munich in Germany, whether we're in the Arab Christian Church in Cairo or the Arab Church in Jordan or, you know, anywhere we go in the world, uh, I, I, I started hearing this trend. So I wrote down in my Bible the passages that were used in the sermons that we were hearing preached throughout the Western church world. And what we found over the, over the, over a 10 year period, and it hasn't changed the last five years because I still hear it. 85% of the sermons preached in Western churches, wherever we find it, find them. The text for the Sunday morning service is taken from Romans to Revelation alone. 15% of the sermons we hear in the more historical, traditional churches is taken from Genesis through Acts. And I got so angry Mm. over that, and God corrected me, because who's in church on Sunday morning? Christians. What's, What's going on in Romans to Revelation? It's Christians talking to Christians. What do you do with your money? What do you do with a piece of land? What do you do with spiritual gifts? What are the roles of men and women? How do you mentor Timothy? How do you prepare for the second coming? Uh, All these Mm -hmm. things that became important uh, uh, to the body of Christ, letters were written by the Apostle Paul, by Simon Peter, by Timothy, you know, by others. John wrote, uh, you know, Revelation. And and, and so uh, this is important. What's missing is not what we're doing in church on Sunday morning because Christians should talk to Christians. And that's not where non-Christians are coming to faith. That's where our children are expressing their faith. What's missing is unlike what Jesus did in the marketplace, he didn't use a single literate tool, but he told the stories of the kingdom of God, the stories of the Old Testament, when people ask him a question, he told them a story. They ask him a question about the story. He told them another story. What's missing hmm. is that 95% of us have not told one story uh, from Genesis through Acts in the marketplace where we work, where we go to school, where we're, where we're sitting with friends hmm. at a restaurant. And stories are non-confrontational. Uh, people ask us a question in Islam. We tell them a story in their homes. They're going to ask us questions for four or five hours, and and I'm going to ask them questions. They're going to still tell stories from the Quran. I'm going to tell stories stories from the Bible. Ruth is going to tell it. The young people that are with us, they know the local language. They're going to tell it, and we're building the stories Mm -hmm. for entire families, and it's so much fun to break bread with them for four or five-plus hours and building those oral stories from Genesis through the book of Acts. And and then we deal with the text of Romans to Revelation. That's what is given to expository preaching, by the way, Mm -hmm. is Romans to Revelation. Stories, uh, Genesis to Revelation, you just need to tell the story and maybe at times unpack the story, but but the yeah. Bible can define the Bible, and, and those stories are so marvelous. <laughs> but when you give up the stories in the marketplace, mm. you've generally given up the witness. And we've made witness a packaged Roman road or a packaged some kind of drive-by shooting when witness yeah. is actually listening uh, two times to every word that you speak. You, you listen uh, to two paragraphs or two stories to every story you tell. Witness is listening mm. two-thirds of the time and talking one-third of the time. Mm. You know, if we have any real savvy listeners, they'll remember a couple of episodes ago, you were unpacking some of these principles, and you left a challenge for people to go into the Word. You answered it just a little while ago. You, you challenged people several weeks ago to go into the Word and say, okay, how did Jesus teach outside of the temple and the synagogue? And you answered it. The, the 
The answer is orally. He didn't use a literate tool out in the marketplace and among the fields and among the, the peoples of the, of the villages. And I remember you've, you've taught this in many different places. One of the uh, ways that persecutors, and this may be a totally different episode later on down the road, one of the ways that persecutors um, can, can get a grip into the church, we saw this, you've, you've seen this a little bit in the Soviet Union and have, have uh, addressed this before, is when you're tied to literate tools and literate clergy. When you're dependent on literate tools only, and you're not incorporating the stories and teaching people in the church to use the stories and share the stories out in the marketplace, you've, you've said that as well, that a, a total dependence on, on literacy can also be a way that persecutors can exploit uh, the church and God's people in, in that, uh, that overt persecution. Yeah, you're exactly right. But the thing that's different is that the, 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 the churches in the Soviet Union had the structures that we have. Mm-hmm. But, but, the, but the, the big deal is uh, they, they were in their communities. Uh, you know, I, I give our, our, our seminaries, I say this often, an A plus for raising up pastors uh, and teachers and a D minus for raising up evangelist church planters. But in the Soviet Union, uh, they they weren't arrested so much for preaching in churches. They were arrested for loving in the marketplace, yeah. and being and being in, in non-believers' homes, and and, and being mm. in the homes of people that were hurting, and 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 and, and therefore they were so respected uh, in the communities that that you know sometimes I'll tell the story, but Muslims that we had saved their lives by feeding programs, you know, in the, in the camps around Mogadishu or we had done mobile medical clinics in 25 villages. We had provided water hose and stuff that al Tahad and Al-Shabaab was coming to our compound to kill me and our staff. And I would find out months later that those Muslim villagers and families would make a corridor around our compound two or three blocks out. And when the bad guys were intersected coming to our compound, they would say, if you want to hurt these Westerners, you're going to have to go through Mm. us because they love us. They fed Mm. us. They've given us water. They've given us seeds and tools, tractors, on and on and on. They've loved us. You don't love us. You just harm us. And, and, And if you want to kill them, you're going to have to kill us first. Well, that's the wow. way communities were in the Soviet Union. When you go, like it says, that you, mm. they said about Jesus that he went about doing good. Well, when you do yeah. good in the marketplace and you heal the sick, what, what did, what did he, John the Baptist ask? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus didn't say, well, you go back and you tell John these words before he's killed. No, you go back and tell John what you hear and see. The blind see, Mm -hmm. the lame walk, the deaf hear, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised, and the gospel is preached to the poorest of the poor. And so Mm -hmm. all of this has taken place in the marketplace. Our faith has left the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And we are self-persecuting. And Mm -hmm. that breaks my heart. And there's no wolf at the door. There, there, there's, there's no one telling us not to do it. I think we're not bad people at all. Mm. I think we're godly and good people. Our problem is we're so doggone mm. busy, we don't have time to be with our neighbors. I mean, That's right. now when, when Ruth and I have come home, we're seeing things we've never seen before. We're seeing families take off Sunday after Sunday to go with their kids to play sports, especially when tournament time. I'm Mm. watching pastors to take a personal day on Sunday to go to sports with their children. Uh, Mm. this is, this is something you would not find in persecution among the faithful. Wow. 
showing up in the marketplace on the Sabbath is probably not going to enhance our witness. Hmm. Wow, you're kicking a pretty big golden calf there. So, well, <laughs> I, 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 I don't say this in church, and I don't say this <laughs> without brokenness, and uh, and I only know one cure for it. But if eight, well, let's just talk about this more because uh, right now I want us to focus on on how they got to where they were. Uh, in the former Soviet Union, and then we're going to compare that to China later on, and compare that to Islam later on. Mm-hmm. But but uh, uh, in in uh, in Russia and, and to a lesser extent in the Ukraine and Eastern Europe, they swallowed the church, mm-hmm. pastors, clergy, piece by piece by piece uh, uh, until uh, uh, they had silenced them. And those hmm. they didn't silence, they, they killed, they put them in prison, they tortured them. But but those stories are still being told, and and those places the churches are still flourishing. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and I'm, but they've got a problem. So many of the uh, uh, pastors and leaders have immigrated. Like I said, we go and teach for five days in the Soviet Union, and we tell all these stories. And people at the workshop will say, where did you get that story? And I'll say, 25 miles from here. They'll say, where did you Mm -hmm. get that story? I said, 75 miles from here. They say, where did you get these powerful stories? I said, in this community. They've lost their stories in one generation. Mm -hmm. They've lost their stories of faithfulness in prison and labor camps and in the marketplace in one generation. So the Soviet wow. Union, under freedom, political freedom, and democracy, and a free market enterprise, became much worse than they were under communism. That's not hmm. a condemnation, because that didn't have to happen. That happened by choice. Uh, they could have claimed in freedom what they also claimed in persecution. Yeah. but. But but when you are defined by increasingly by stuff and you're defined by being able to immigrate, not just the clergy, but church people mm-hmm. of all kinds of situations, then the latter state is worse than the former state. That's also a story mm-hmm. in the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate you giving time to me today. No, no, no. I, we appreciate your time. That's incredible. And you know, honestly, for our listeners, I think that's a good, uh, I, I hope if you're listening today that you're just going to maybe take this in pieces over the next few days once we once we post it, because there's a lot in there. And again, there's, there's no condemnation or judgment from your heart or from our heart at all. These are just observations that you have seen in the former Soviet Union uh, over those those decades. And I really pray, especially for our listeners in the West today, there are a lot of parallels that we may see. And there are a lot of things that we might uh, be doing now that are very similar to how uh, persecution happened in in the the Soviet Union during those decades. There may be some things that define us in the same way. How are we going to respond? And and do we want to do things uh, differently to be obedient and to, to take Jesus back into the marketplaces or maybe we have removed him uh, from our witness. Well, there's certainly a lot that we need to talk about. There's certainly a lot that I need to deal with when I look in the mirror. Um, Mm. There's certainly a lot. If I had to start over again, uh, as I told a a, a church this weekend near where you live, uh, Mm -hmm. I thought by the way that I fed my family after I came to Christ at 18 and Ruth and I married, uh, she was 22. I was 23. I thought the way that I fed my family by preaching on Sunday morning, doing something with the church on Sunday night, and then doing Bible study and prayer meeting on Wednesday night. And then we did some of that when we got to Africa, but mostly doing church planting. But of course, when I got mm. to Somalia and got to the harder places, 
And I couldn't do the Sunday morning, the Sunday night, the Wednesday night stuff, the community stuff. How do I feed my wife? How do I feed my kids when there's no church to take them to? I thought I mentored my wife and children by being their pastor. And I should have known I did that by being their husband, her husband, and their father. Oh, Mm. I wish I could start over. Wow. Hear, the word, hear the words of the Lord if you're listening to that. Yeah. And honestly, that's why we do this, because you have these years where you're giving back to people who may be starting some of these journeys for the very first time. I, I, used, to to count, I used to count years. Now I count decades. <laughs> well, you're not that old in my book. So, yeah. <laughs> well, Nick, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your wisdom. Listeners, thank you for tuning in today. I hope that you're blessed. I hope that you really can take some of this stuff to heart. You've been listening to Witness and Persecution with Nick Ripkin. My name is Anthony Ball, your host. If you'd like more information about our ministry, including how to support us, how to find different and new materials and resources, you can go to our website, www.nickripkin.com. Again, if you'd like more information about our ministry, you can go find us at www.nickripkin.com. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you'll be with us next time.